Welcome to another episode of Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya. Hit subscribe. Be a subscriber. We'd love to have you with us every single time we drop a podcast. So make it simple. Click subscribe and you'll never miss one. And today is an important one. It's about a topic that can feel overwhelming. It can seem very far away and it can seem to people that it, eh, it doesn't really going to, it's not going to affect my life, but it is in many, many ways that you don't even realize, but you will after you listen to our next guest. What's going on between China and Taiwan and where the United States fits into this is really important to your daily life, not to mention the moral implications of what a war or an invasion might look like. Are we prepared to help Taiwan? What are we prepared to do to stand up against China? And what could this mean to your daily life? You know, we think about world wars in the past and they seem behind us. We know that they're not. We know that we're, they're not. And anything involving China would be massive. So we turn to an expert. Jimmy Quinn is the national security correspondent for National Review, which is a, a nice place to, to be working and, and someone who knows his stuff forward and backward. He's been with us before, and today we're going to talk about what these recent visits between the United States and Taiwan mean in this whole big picture. And how do we stand? How do we measure up to China militarily? Are we ready? When do we need to be ready? All of this in a fascinating interview with Jimmy Quinn, and that is next. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. Jimmy Quinn, welcome back. It's good to have you. Although I'm curious about these circumstances we're facing right now. There's been a lot of Washington, D.C. leadership interacting with the president of Taiwan, and this seems to get under the skin of China, or at least they use it as a pretext to sort of bully a little bit. What, what can you tell us about what the circumstances are right now between the United States and Taiwan and and, and how much of it is worrying you about China? Michelle, first, thank you so much for having me back. It's, it's really great to be back on your show. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a very worrying time, but uh, there's been a silver lining here in the, uh, the uptick in diplomatic interactions between the U.S. and Taiwan. We've seen uh, many dozens of trips that lawmakers have taken to Taiwan in recent months over the past, you know, two or three years. Um, and capping that off uh, were last August, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, and more recently, the Taiwanese president's visit to the United States to meet with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Uh, so this is a very bipartisan thing where members of Congress on both sides of the aisle are saying they're not scared of Chinese bullying, and they're ready to fully support uh, uh, U.S. partners in Taipei. Um, so uh, the Taiwanese president's visit uh, concluded last week. Uh, she first stopped in New York, and then she went through South America and came back through Los Angeles, where uh, she met with Kevin McCarthy and a bipartisan congressional delegation. Um, and this was a, a major new development in the U.S.-Taiwan diplomatic relationship. Never before had a Taiwanese president met such a high-ranking official on U.S. soil. Um, and this is something where uh, McCarthy was able to pull this off and uh, really take a stand in support of Taiwan without making it a partisan thing or, or a personal legacy thing. Uh, he, he really uh, exemplified great leadership here in uh, meeting with this U.S. partner uh, and ensuring that members of Congress on both sides of the aisle uh, could speak with their uh, Taiwanese partners and have a conversation about a range of different things from uh, U.S. arms sales to trade uh, to uh, diplomatic support of the country as it faces down um, a Chinese uh, political and uh, military onslaught 
uh, with the potential for uh, a military assault by uh, China on Taiwan, on Taiwan sometime in the, the next several years. This is something that people in Washington are very, very worried about right now, looking at the way in which the People's Liberation Army has built itself up recently. Yeah, it. I'm wondering why. I think I know the answer, but I'd rather hear it from an expert like you, Jimmy, as to why, if if she were the president of Taiwan, were here on both coasts, why wouldn't President Joe Biden meet with her? Would that be a bridge too far for China? Yeah. So there are certain uh, diplomatic guidelines uh, that the U.S. government follows when it comes to interacting with uh, their Taiwanese counterparts. And we, we saw that uh, Speaker McCarthy's visit was very carefully tailored uh, uh, in conversations between their office and the Taiwanese and the White House in making sure that uh, the, the members of Congress weren't taking steps that would give China a pretext uh, to uh, engage in particularly belligerent activity. Now, whatever the Taiwanese do, whatever U.S. Congress does, um, the Chinese are going to react and they're going to take advantage of the situation and say, now we're going to begin these exercises and encircle Taiwan and, you know, potentially uh, do all of these missile launches like, like we saw after Pelosi's visit. Um, but M McCarthy worked very closely with the Taiwanese who were a little concerned that a visit by uh, McCarthy right now uh, would give the Chinese a pretext to do all of that. Um, so th this is something that, uh, you know, the U.S. side and the Taiwanese side are negotiating very carefully to ensure that um, Taiwan isn't put in a more precarious uh, security position right now. Um, and so any constraints on, you know, the executive branch's uh, interactions with Taiwan uh, are, you know, uh, are shaped in part by uh, those Taiwanese concerns as well as uh, rules that, you know, the, the State Department or the executive branch might have. And there, there are people who have argued for lifting some of those rules or eliminating them in their entirety. Um, and we're, we're getting to a point where more uh, conversations between American officials and Taiwanese officials are becoming possible. And there's an evolution in uh, the U.S. policy toward Taiwan. But uh, it, it's not happening overnight. And we've seen some uh, really positive steps taken uh, over the past few years. But as you said, the, 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 the response from China and the CCP is to encircle Taiwan, is to have all these exercises going on and, and, and so on and so forth. And what is, I, 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 my guess is that behind the scenes, the United States has assured Taiwan that they will come to their aid should China attack. And China's got to know that too, right? So, so how do we avoid all of that? And, and is there enough deterrence? from the U.S. military. Is the U.S. military prepared to provide enough deterrence uh, in, in this whole web? Because it just it it does seem as though China has really ramped up its military. And I, I don't know where we stand here in the United States. I think most serious observers would tell you that we need to do a lot more and fast to ensure that we are prepared to deter a Chinese military assault on Taiwan. I, I don't think that's a very controversial thing to say. Uh, we, we have a massive backlog when it comes to arming the Taiwanese and uh, ensuring that they have the weapons that they need uh, to turn Taiwan effectively into what people call a porcupine, bristling with uh, all of these sort of uh, stinger type missiles and harpoons, weapons that you can use to shoot down Chinese planes and uh, to go after Chinese vessels that are crossing the Taiwan Strait. Um, so we need to do a lot more on that front. And uh, at the same time, uh, you know, we, we need to do more to ensure that uh, our military, the U.S. military, is prepared to do this and, and that uh, we are producing enough weapons and that we're getting the defense industrial base uh, prepared to uh, deter a Chinese attack on Taiwan. And if there's one thing that we've learned over the past uh, few years uh, with what we've seen with Ukraine and with um, sort of these supply chain issues uh, during COVID, uh, and, and other related things is that uh, the defense industrial base uh, is not ready uh, to rev into mass production mode. Uh, the Pentagon is working on this, the defense industry is working on this, and, and they're making a lot of progress. Um, but uh, there's, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And the, the troubling thing uh, is that uh, the Chinese say that they want to be ready by 2027 uh, to be able to uh, seize Taiwan uh, and to annex it. 
Um, that doesn't mean that an attack will come in 2027. That's just the date by which uh, the Chinese want to be capable of executing such an attack. Um, but it, it, it's still all very concerning. And well, it, uh, Washington's it also, playing catch up. Does it also mean necessarily that they wouldn't attack sooner than 2027? I mean, it would be sort of silly to give a deadline out there that that, you know, to put a date on this. I, I would think that they might be ready to attack sooner. Why would they put a date out there, Jimmy? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's definitely a possibility. Um, but I, I think we would see some warning signs in advance. There, there are analysts who say, well, this is something that would be even larger than D-Day. It's a massive um, amphibious assault across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, Taiwan is, you know, very mountainous, and uh, it would take a lot of preparation that we would see far in advance. Uh, it, it's certainly possible, though. I mean, we, we just don't really know. Um, the only thing that we can do right now is uh, prepare and be ready to uh, deter an attack, which is the current U.S. policy. But it's a question, uh, you know, of how fast we're able to do it and uh, how committed we are to uh, growing the defense budget, uh, uh, making sure that production is where it needs to be, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, yeah, they, they, there are a lot of people who are very, very worried about this right now. I think people would also be concerned, Jimmy, that you look at what's gone on with Ukraine and Russia and whether or not the U.S. has been forceful enough in that to to really assure people that, you know, Joe Biden says we put boots on the ground in Taiwan. Does he mean that? We'll get into more of this with Jimmy Quinn again from the National Review right after this. I'm always flattered when people tell me I don't look my age. I'm 58, but I feel really good about my skin. And I'm going to let you in on, on a little secret about my skincare treatment. It's Genucel, G-E-N-U-C-E-L. It's an amazing antioxidant-based skincare company. And it's manufactured right here in the USA. And you know that's important. It's formulated by a pharmacist. And the quality ingredients are sure to smooth out fine lines and wrinkles while preventing new ones from coming up. And one of my favorites is the Deep Firming Serum with stem cell technology. This stuff, you just put it on over your cleansed skin and your skin feels fresher, brighter, tighter, more plump. It's just amazing. And right now you can save over 70% off Genucel's most popular package just in time for this warm spring weather we're encountering. It features Genucel's Ultra Retinol that contains a powerful retinol alternative. It's safe on your skin in the summer sun. And it also features Genucel's Dark Spot Corrector to reduce the appearance of dark marks and sunspots from long summer days outside, which we love. And we don't love the dark spots, which is why this product is so great. Plus, you'll still get Genucel's classic under eye bags therapy for those horribly annoying under eye bags and puffiness. And with its immediate effects, you'll see results in as little as 12 hours guaranteed or your money back. So what do you have to lose? Don't wait. Visit genucel.com, G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash Michelle to save over 70% off their most popular package. Plus every order subscription includes a luxury gift box with two free springtime essentials. That's two free gifts plus free concierge shipping for a limited time. Go to genucel.com slash Michelle. It's G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash Michelle with one L, M-I-C-H-E-L-E. Don't forget, and you'll save over 70%. So Jimmy, if, if history is to be our guide, at least recent history, we've seen that Russia felt emboldened to attack Ukraine. And the United States has certainly been giving arms and funds to Ukraine. But to our knowledge, no boots on the ground. They say they will put boots on the ground. Joe Biden has said this in Taiwan if Taiwan is, is attacked by China. But I know I, I've seen people in Taiwan interviewed that aren't convinced they will have the full support of the United States. What do you think? So I've spoken to lawmakers in Taiwan from, uh, you know, both major parties there, the uh, more, let's call it hawkish uh, 
DPP, which is currently in power, uh, and uh, the KMT, uh, which uh, wants to see deterrence, but also more conversation with China to prevent a conflict. Um, and I, I, I think the general consensus that I heard is that they're sure that the U.S. will do something in the event of a Chinese attack on Taiwan. Uh, they, they don't know what uh, form that will take, whether that means uh, we're just going to send the seventh fleet into the Taiwan Strait uh, and, and kind of hang out there, or uh, whether there's going to be a more direct US military in intervention uh, involving US service members. Um, but they're, they're expecting some kind of support right now. But the other line that I've heard from the Taiwanese government is that regardless of what the U.S. does, Taiwan has to be ready to fight. Mm -hmm. And they say that they're willing to defend uh, their country. Um, but they're also asking for U.S. support, uh, whatever, whatever form that uh, may take right now. Uh, President Biden has said on, uh, I believe, four different occasions that the U.S. would come to uh, Taiwan's defense. Um, and each time, uh, those remarks were walked back by the, the White House, by uh, officials uh, in his administration. Um, so uh, there's this kind of confusing uh, policy right now from the current administration. Um, and it, it's not very clear. It's kind of muddling uh, what the U.S. policy has already been. They're not officially departing from it. Um, but they're also taking steps that uh, go far beyond what uh the U.S. policy has been on uh, a military uh, U.S. intervention in support of Taiwan. Um, so that that creates some confusion. Um, and coupled with uh, the U.S., the current U.S. refusal uh, to provide the sort of weapons that the Ukrainians need to, uh, you know, launch an offensive, a counteroffensive to seize, uh, you know, occupied Ukrainian territory uh, and the Afghanistan withdrawal that we saw, that, that raises some very serious questions about our ability to, to signal that we're serious about deterrence right now. How important is it to have a concrete message from the president? As you said, he said on multiple occasions, we will support Taiwan. We will fight for them, with them, against China in so many words. He's put it a, a little more um, muted, perhaps, but basically said, we'll, we yes, we'd put boots on the ground. And then other people in his administration walk it back. Is that purposeful to keep to keep it muddled so that U.S.-China relations remain stable, or is this? Should there be a more forceful, concrete stance from this White House? Yeah, I think it's probably a little distracting to have this back and forth where the president says something and then his aides uh, the next day uh, basically say. Well, that's not exactly what he meant, and uh, there's no real policy change here. That probably distracts from the other things that we've talked about, um, increasing diplomatic engagement with Taiwan to prevent it from becoming isolated on the world stage, uh, ensuring that the Taiwanese have the, the weapons that they need uh, to defend themselves against an attack, deepening uh, U.S.-Taiwan trade ties. Um, there, there are all these other things that uh, we should be doing first uh, before uh, the president uh, makes all these statements that uh, gets ahead of what his aides want or before his aides start rolling back what the president says. It, it just creates kind of this circus-like effect, and um, it probably uh, isn't very helpful in the long run. Yeah, it's, this is so interesting. For, for people who, and, and I think I'm one of them, uh, I, this is why we have experts like you that we get to rely on and feel so fortunate to have with us, Jimmy. It, it, the, can you put in layman's terms what the one China policy really means? And why on the one hand, you hear that the, we, we agree to the one China policy, but on the other hand, we'll, we'll help defend Taiwan if they're attacked. Can you sort of put those into really basic terms for those of us who, who need further clarification on what that means? Yeah, so, so the one China policy is confusing uh, because it encompass, encompasses all of these uh, diplomatic documents and communiques and assurances that we've made separately to Taiwan. But the gist of it is that uh, we acknowledge that China claims Taiwan as its own. We don't recognize those claims. We do not necessarily say that those claims are legitimate. Um, but at the same time, we're going to do everything in our ability to 
uh, support Taiwan, uh, including, uh, you know, diplomatic engagement and arms sales to uh, ensure that the Taiwanese are able to defend themselves. Um, China tries to uh, trip people up and confuse them uh, by saying that uh, when we talk about the one China policy, we are agreeing to China's claims over Taiwan, which is false. Uh, that's uh, CCP propaganda, um, and they're trying to push their own uh, what's called a one China principle uh, instead of the one China policy, which doesn't actually acknowledge those claims. Um, but the, the, the upshot for uh, your viewers is that we're supportive of Taiwan. We want to make sure that the Taiwanese have uh, the, the weapons that they need and, uh, you know, the ability to protect themselves. Indeed. Um, and, and it certainly seems that the... The the uh, I, I I fear for using the word appeasement because of what it hints toward, but this this placating of China, this this desire to keep these diplomatic relations positive with China seemed to me to be commercially um, influenced or motivated more than anything else. In other words, we know that there are human rights violations going on every single minute in China. We, we know uh, that it is a communist country that it, it really doesn't share any of our values, that their hostility is growing, that their long-term aim um, basically calls for, if not the destruction of the United States, certainly the minimization of, of its power. So are, are we purely motivated by the dollars that are available in trade with China, or is there something moral here that I'm not seeing? Well, I mean, as far as the uh, situation around Taiwan that we're, we're talking about just now, um, it's, it's all of the above, right? It's our, it's our interests. It's in the U.S. national interest to ensure that China does not seize Taiwan and therefore break through the first island chain and uh, be able to project power uh, more directly into the Pacific. Um, and to disrupt trade and, uh, you know, travel um, and all of these things that, uh, you know, are critical and involved uh, in freedom of navigation. Um, but it's also a moral thing. Uh, if the Chinese invade Taiwan, uh, you're seeing a free nation, a democracy of 24 million people taken over by a totalitarian power that has shown that it's willing to put people into uh, prison camps uh, arbitrarily to execute uh, political prisoners. Um, there was recently a, a Chinese official uh, during a recent Chinese government meeting who said that um, uh, the People's Liberation Army, once Taiwan is captured, uh, should uh, have these blacklists of people to go after and to execute, these execution blacklists. Um, and so uh, if, if Taiwan were to be invaded, uh, it, would, it would be a humanitarian catastrophe uh, involving so many millions of people. So, so there, there are, you know, uh, you know, very tangible interests, uh, you know, the, the, there's trade we're, we're talking about, uh, where most of the world's, um, uh, semiconductors, uh, you know, are, are, are produced. Um, but it, it's also, uh, very much a moral thing. Yeah. It's to people who say, leave it between China and Taiwan. It's their issue, not ours. We should stay isolated and out of it. Um, this is not our fight to fight. You know, wh what would you what would you say? I would say um, that, uh, I, again, all, all of the above, what, what, what I just said, right, that this matters to Americans. Uh, the impact that we saw after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where um, energy prices spiked, the, the price of goods around the world went up. Um, uh, there's this impact on the global food supply. We're going to see, uh, you know, uh, very essential economic and supply chain effects just like that, uh, but perhaps 10 times more, 20 times more, even, you know, uh, e even more than that, potentially. Um, this is going to ensure that uh, if, if a Chinese invasion does occur and if it is successful, Americans will be less safe uh, and they'll be less prosperous. Um, and uh, that, that's something that uh, strikes at the very core of uh, America's national security. Uh, so it's something that more people should be paying attention to and, uh, frankly, a, a little more worried about, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I agree. And I don't like to to 
sort of promote people worrying, but concern should certainly be there for all of the reasons you just stated, in addition to which it would be a human rights catastrophe, as you said. It would be awful for Taiwan, and they are our friends, and they need us. Um, Jimmy Quinn, I hope I haven't simplified things too much, but I, I do like the listeners to 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 have a kind of a clear understanding of what we're talking about here. And, and it does worry me. It really does worry me. Um, so I, I like your even handed, clear minded, well informed uh, expertise on this. You're always welcome on this show. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me, Michelle. It's great to be back. Likewise, it was good to have you folks. This has been sideline sanity. Don't forget to be brave. And do good and follow Jimmy Quinn. You can follow him on Twitter. You can read all of his stuff. He makes this very accessible to everyone. And it is, as as he just said, unfortunately, we do need to pay closer attention. We do need to be concerned and we do need to have um, a stance on this. So, Jimmy, thanks again. Thanks, Michelle.